what does it mean to take a feminist perspective on ethics? In other words, what does it mean to do ethics from a feminist perspective? Perhaps a good way of entering this topic would be through the distinction among the fields of ethical inquiry, namely normative ethics, applied ethics, and meta-ethics. There is certainly a lot of overlap among these fields in ethics, but the distinction among the types of questions that they ask is nevertheless useful. For the most part, the typical college ethics course would be focused on normative ethics, which is essentially concerned with answering the twin questions, given a particular moral dilemma, what is the right thing to do? And what makes this the right thing to do? In the typical ethics course, you would be considering various ethical theories, that is to say, various accounts of what principles make an action right, and how to determine one's course of action on the basis of those principles. So perhaps by this time, you would be familiar with such ethical theories as utilitarianism, virtue ethics, uh, natural law ethics, and deontological ethics. Applied ethics is concerned with the application of moral theories to specific fields of practice. Its concern would be the examination of problems that arise from a certain field of experience and the formulation of ethical norms, st certainly still relying on the broad principles that you would find in normative ethics, but this time applied to the dilemmas particular to this or that field. Bioethics, which would cover questions that arise from advances in medical practice, such as artificial life support, for instance, uh, business ethics, environmental ethics, are examples of areas in applied ethics. Metaethics would be the field of ethical inquiry which is not directly concerned with a practical question of what to do but rather with meta or higher order reflexive questions about morality. For instance, where normative ethics would concern itself with the question, what is your reason for saying that this is the right thing to do? A meta-ethical question would be, what would count as a reason for moral deliberation? For instance, would feelings count as reasons? Would religious beliefs count as reasons? Or, another example of a meta-ethical question would be, what are the bases for our moral intuitions? Uh, are our moral intuitions based on universal reason or on culture? So, for instance, the, you know, the question of moral relativism is uh, a question that belongs to uh, meta-ethics. Where would you place feminist ethics? That's actually a trick question. I began with a taxonomy of ethics questions in order to note that feminist ethics is a mode of questioning that can be pursued in any of these three modes of ethical inquiry. For example, in the field of bioethics, so in the level of applied ethics in other words, one could address the ethical question of whether the practice of surrogacy is morally acceptable. Is it moral to implant an embryo in the womb of a woman who is not the genetic parent, for her to facilitate the gestation, and for her to give birth to a child whom she will have to give up? The moral problem arises because of advances in biotechnological knowledge and medical practices. In other words, the moral question arises because surrogacy is now medically possible. But the issue is not only a medical or technological issue, but rather a complex moral one. And precisely because it is a complex issue, it is not immediately obvious what normative moral approach should be applied and how it should be applied. And moreover, there is no guarantee that in analyzing the ethical question, the perspective of the woman as a woman would be taken into account.
One can imagine, for instance, that an ethical analysis of the issue would center on the question of what reproductive practices are consistent with natural law without inquiring into the gender norms that undergird the situation in which surrogacy arises. One could ask questions like, is surrogacy against nature? Is it compatible with the order of natural inclinations? Without asking, well, whose inclinations are we speaking about? Do we listen to the voices of the women, the surrogate, and the one using the surrogate? their needs and their interests, their rights to their bodies. Do we take these questions into account in our moral calculations? For instance, one could ask whether maternal surrogacy is not just about the mechanization of human reproduction, but also a manifestation of a patriarchal viewpoint that treats the maternal body as nothing but a medium of reproduction that ensures the offspring's genetic provenance? Or might one consider the possibility that given the limited options open to poor women who are doubly constrained by their economic status and their gender, whether for these women, surrogacy becomes a way for some of them to exercise their agency. Or to take another example in the field of the ethics of teaching, Right, so this is another example in the field of um, applied ethics. So if we talk about the ethics of teaching, yes, there is such a thing, which is interested in articulating norms in the field of education. What would a feminist approach to the ethics of teaching look like? It would ask about gender biases in grading, for instance. It would ask questions such as, do classroom practices capitalize on gendered expectations of both teachers and students? Do unchecked gender stereotypes, such as the notion that girls are more diligent and reliable than boys, do these stereotypes lead to the exploitation of female students by their male counterparts? Are expectations regarding male and female professors the same? Or do gender stereotypes about teachers and students enable sexual harassment in the educational setting? It should be noted that very often, questions in ethics are generated precisely at the conjunction or overlap between the different levels of ethical discourse. As I shall now discuss, a great deal of feminist theorizing occurs at the meta-ethical level as an outcome of feminist critiques of the normative ethical theories that dominate ethical theory. So uh, at this point of the lecture, I will discuss two uh, well-known ethical theorists, Aristotle and Kant. So for instance, by reading Aristotle with a feminist lens, one is led to ask whether Aristotle's notion of virtue is gendered, whether some virtues are seen to be characteristic of and appropriate to men or women, and whether certain virtues are expected of men but not of women and vice versa. It turns out that if you look at Aristotle's writings, you would find that he holds double standards of virtue for men and women. For instance, in the Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle writes, so this is a quote from Aristotle, It is surprising if a man is defeated by and cannot resist pleasures or pains, which most men can hold out against, when this is not due to heredity or disease, like the softness that, that is hereditary with the kings of Scythians, or that which distinguishes the female sex from the male. End of quote. And in the politics, he writes, the temperance of a man and a woman or the courage and justice of a man and of a woman are not, as Socrates maintained, the same. The courage of a man is shown in commanding, of a woman in obeying. Let's stop there for a bit. <laughs> 
The courage of a man is shown in commanding of a woman in obeying. I confess that I am perplexed by what it means for there to be courage in obeying, unless this is perhaps an unwitting admission by a man that women are often risking their lives in obeying the men who move them. But in any case, however you would make sense of this, one should resist the temptation to simply elide these perplexing and disconcerting passages when thinking about Aristotle's ethical theory. Rather than simply dismissing such comments as antiquated notions that are peripheral to the theory of virtue ethics, a meta-ethical feminist critique might ask, do similar gendered stereotypes still govern our expectations of virtuous actions? And do such stereotypes curtail the full development of women's moral and political capacity? If, for example, obedience is seen as a virtue appropriate to women, would this not discourage women from speaking their own mind, and in particular, from courageously voicing their disagreement with authority figures, who are very often male? Wouldn't this unconscious, unquestioned notion that we have about what a virtuous woman is like, silent, obedient, chaste, wouldn't this notion of virtue have the effect of curtailing the agency and, in particular, the political agency of women? Wouldn't it, moreover, enable the culture of silence that surrounds sexual abuse and harassment? Now I'll talk about Kant. Another major line of meta-ethical feminist inquiry asks whether the widely accepted understanding of moral deliberation in taking a rationalist orientation is a gendered one. For instance, take Kant's deontological ethics. While it is true that Kant does not discount the importance of feelings in ethics, he does, after all, recognize the value of a benevolent disposition. He is also very clear in his position that we should not rely on one's emotions for sound moral judgment. If there is a feeling that Kant would trust, it would not be compassion or sympathy, which are often absent in us, but respect, respect for law, and respect for the self-rule or autonomy that the rational being is capable of. In other words, respect for reason itself, reason abstractly embodied by law, and reason concretely embodied in the human being who has an absolute worth precisely in so far as he is capable of morality. Now, there are at least two questions that can be posed regarding Kant and Kantian ethics. One, whether Kant's notion of moral reasoning is a gendered one, whether, like Aristotle's understanding of courage, for instance, whether for Kant, moral reasoning is primarily reserved for men, and whether women are seen to be capable of a merely derivative and analogous version of moral reasoning. Unfortunately, the answer to that question is yes. In his observations on the feeling of the beautiful and the sublime, Kant talks about woman's beautiful understanding in contrast to man's noble understanding. Women's moral intuitions, and I use intuitions here deliberately because it's appropriate rather than judgment, women's uh, moral intuitions are seen to be based on feelings and not on reason. According to this view, her morality is based on feelings and intuitions, particularly on feelings of sympathy for the particular human beings closest to her daily experience but she is unable to give a rational justification with a universal scope for her moral judgments. That capacity would require thinking from a universal perspective. The difference between the two kinds of morality would be the difference between, on the one hand, acting on the basis of feeling and particular interests and motivations, since feelings are always occasioned by the particular, and on the other hand, acting on the basis of principle, 
According to Kant, and now again, this is a quote from uh, the observations on the feeling of the beautiful and the sublime. So Kant says, women will avoid the wicked not because it is unright, but because it's ugly. And virtuous actions mean to them such as are morally beautiful. Nothing of duty, nothing of compulsion, nothing of obligation. End of quote. And we have to remember for Kant, obligation is a good word. <laughs> so if you say uh, nothing of obligation, that means it's not real morality. So, if you recall your groundwork for the metaphysics of morals, you would see that for Kant, strictly speaking, the former kind of moral reasoning, although it should be approved and cultivated, properly speaking, has no moral worth and does not constitute the essence of morality because it does not arise out of an adherence to principles of reason. And actions arising from it are not done for the sake of duty, but depends on one's inclinations, one's feelings, one's preferences, and one's needs. It is the kind of moral calculation that is easily swayed by one's fears and desires, and are therefore unreliable, rather than based on convictions held on to despite the undesirable personal consequences of doing what is simply, that is to say, what is in principle right. Two, so the second uh, feminist meta-ethical question that we can pose about Kant. Two, a feminist meta-ethical examination of Kantian ethics would ask, whether the very privileging of reason over emotions is itself problematic. If, rather than looking at Kantian ethics abstractly, we situate it within broadly accepted and operative gender stereotypes, which associate women with emotions and men with reason, then we will have to ask whether an ethical theory that privileges reason and to a great extent excludes or devalues emotions undermines the agency and autonomy of women. Is it possible that even as we champion the autonomy of rational beings, is it possible that by accepting these twin presuppositions, one, that the essence of morality is reason, and two, that women are less rational than men and thus less qualified for rational discourse, is it possible that we end up denying women their full autonomy? These are not just abstract considerations of theory. Who counts as an agent? Who is recognized as an actor in the social and political sphere? Who can claim rights and demand accountability? whose words are listened to. In other words, who counts as an autonomous moral subject cannot be answered abstractly without looking at concrete conditions. To give you an example of what it would mean for us to examine how moral agency might be a gendered concept, let us look at the phenomenon of infantilizing women. Recently, Frankie Pangilinan, after speaking up against victim blaming and rape culture, received a dose of mansplaining. You know what mansplaining is? Mansplaining is the condescending, patronizing speech of a man explaining things to a woman. So, Frankie Pangilinan receives a dose of mansplaining from Ben Tulfo and a rape threat in social media. Both responses serve to invalidate her voice by undermining her status as a participant in a discursive space which the men insist are reserved for men. By casting her critique of victim blaming in this way, this social media post is sending the following messages. One, women speaking on behalf of rape victims are themselves inviting rape. Two, 
Critique of victim blaming is futile because having thus invited sexual violence, that is by to say by speaking up, women who protest sexual violence are to blame for their potential victimization. Three, in other words, it's not just how women dress, but also how women speak. That is to blame for their being sexually assaulted. And finally, to sum it all up, the big message is that rape is the business of men. Men decide what is to be done or not done about it, and women should stay out of the discussion. A feminist critique of Kantian ethics, therefore, is not just about calling out you know, Kant for his sexist views, but about drawing out the concrete ethical implications of such views upon the lives of those who suffer gender-based injustice. Thank you.